So we're going to carry on with um, our presentations uh, this afternoon, and we're really delighted that um, Pragya Agarwal is part of this event and brings her perspective as a professor of social inequalities. She's a behavioral and data scientist and the founder of a research think tank investigating gender equalities. And anyone who has read Pragya's writing, and I'm, I'm sort of clutching my copy of it here, and I think this has been one of the really wonderful things about this event, as well as the sharing of literature and a, a building bibliography. But also, we sometimes carry books around with us as sort of uh, talismanic um, as well. So I think there's something about that, about where these ideas and where an event has come from. And, and uh, the ideas contained in this book are definitely have been very generative in helping us shape um, today. So I'm, I'm clutching um, a copy and it's actually, this belongs to my colleague Alice Reed, who is the digital marketing manager at the Paul Mellon Centre. So I also want to just shout out to someone who's not here but who is going to be listening to the recordings and helping us process them and put them online. So this is Alice's copy and um, but it's also very much, I think the title of the event pays homage to, to your work um, as well. And um, again, if you've read the book, you'll know that this, the prose in it is uh, searching and sometimes it's searing in its honesty. And I think, Pragya, as well, your, your work raises for us these complex questions about intersectionality, about gender and about race and how, again, the, the politics of um, gender, being a mother, the experiences of um, access to medical care, um, as a woman as well, are very different in different places. And so we're really looking forward to having your perspective um, about these complex experiences and journeys which are never fixed and actually are constantly unfolding. So please join me in welcoming Pragya Agarwal to give her presentation. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, I, I use my glasses to read, but when I look up, I can't see anything. So <laughs> if, <laughs> it's not because I'm like ignoring you or anything, but so I can't do both things at the same time. Um, but thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be here. Thank you for organizing this. This space has been really special. I was just saying how um, full I feel, but also there's a lot of like challenging things and uncomfortable things as well. And so you need to process them all over again, again and again, go through the same thing. Um, uh, for a long time, I didn't talk about mothering or motherhood because as a professional, I felt like this is not something that aligns with my professional life as an academic in STEM domain, where I was the first woman lecturer in an engineering department and, and a single parent for a long time. I had my first child when I was 19 and it was unplanned. For a long time, I thought I didn't want a child because I'd already only seen a specific notion or model of mothering and motherhood. And I didn't think I wanted to be one of those. And then I have one and it was a very traumatic pregnancy. I almost died. I was in a, in a kind of an abusive context relationship. So um, that also affected my sense of being an identity. So I am very interested in the notion of otherness and othering and the belonging and how we become mothers or not mothers when we are still searching for ourselves. Um, and then um, I also, and then I wrote this whole book after not talking about it for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the things you do sometimes. And, <laughs> um, and then I wrote about um, also abortion and things I wrote about it in this book. And I'm sorry, there'll be topics here will, which might be uncomfortable. And I, um, I hope we can hold the space for everybody. Um, but also sometimes we just have to sit with the discomfort as well, I think. It's really important. Um, I wrote about abortion, about the fact that it was a right decision. But then I went through secondary infertility, um, number of failed IVF cycles. Um, and that that kind of notion of almost being a mother but not a mother and also being a mother already um, and then that alternative timeline already always existing in your brain. I think I thought about that quite a lot and still think about it. So I, I'm really interested in that notion of ambivalence and ambiguity when I know it was the right decision but I still cannot not imagine those alternative realities that could have existed on every year. 
So, um, and then um, I became a mother again, but I didn't birth my children. And so I also thought a lot about how do you become a mother without that notion of birthing where so much um, is assigned to the process of giving birth to become a mother, that process. Um, and for a long time I worried I wouldn't be able to love them as much as I do now. Um, and so I also investigated a lot about the scientific aspects of that maternal brain and what happens in your brain. And, um, and so I, I thought about this presentation a lot, more than I should have. Uh, <laughs> I wondered how I can compress all my thoughts about mothering, motherhood, emotional labor, motherhood, penalty, art, creativity, choices, fertility in these few minutes. So I basically thought about it and didn't do anything. I made millions of notes and I started and abandoned presentations. I procrastinated. Um, but in the end, here we are. Um, <laughs> I will bring in some of my research in here, read some excerpts from my book, Motherhood, and reflect on art and artists who have responded to the themes that I'm most interested in. I will talk about some of the issues that are closest to my heart, about the marginalization and otherhood in motherhood, how we compress some of these conversations in a very polarized binary view. We might believe that a discussion of fertility, of mothering and motherhood only affects mothers or those considering becoming mothers. But as philosopher Mary O'Brien argue, argues in The Politics of Reproduction, much of our social theories have been focused largely in gender divides and on the male half of the world. And a critical theory of reproduction that echoes with everyone who identifies as a woman is sorely missing. She says that women's reproductive consciousness is culturally transmitted. It's a tribute to the indelibility of mainstream thought that we should have to make this point. The historical isolation of women from each other, the whole language of female internality and privacy, the exclusion of women from the creation of a political community, all of these have obscured the cultural cohesiveness of femininity and the universality of maternal consciousness. Um, so I wanted to start with those early days of mothering the second stint and how making art or any form of creativity was for me an act of resistance. I remember pe people telling me that you can, um, and you have to understand that it's a, it's a really big act of courage, bravery, and sort of insanity to put up any of my art in a room full of artists here. So, <laughs> so just have to just, just keep that in mind. <laughs> I remember people telling me that you can forget doing anything once the children are born and adamantly refuse to accept any, that anything will change at all. So I order a lot of art materials, and in any of those pauses and lulls, I spread out on a, one table in the small room with all my paints, pens, and sketchbooks, and I draw. I paint the poppy fields and the rolling hills covered with heather, and I paint rickshaws, scooters, trucks crisscrossing the roads around me. I paint images of what I think is home and of my homeland. In drawing these images from my recent and past travels, painting landscapes that exist in my imagination and in the urban chaos around me, I stubbornly hold on to a semblance of my old self. I try desperately to carry on with my, with my business, my research, my consultancy, working late and little. Perhaps this release of oxytocin while curling and unfurling through those scribbles is what my mother's brain needs. Motherhood is idolized. The struggle between the self before motherhood and the unpolished, often unrecognized, sometimes unimaginable version after becoming one is not something we often see in literature or media. Rachel Cusk writes in her memoir, A Life's Work, that after her daughter's birth, her appetite for the world was insatiable, omnivorous, an expression of longing for some lost pre-maternal self and for the freedom that self had perhaps enjoyed, perhaps squandered. When one tries to talk about this death of the individual self as one gives birth to a new human being or not, or the annihilation of what once was in order to raise a child, one is demonized. Guilt, anxiety, conflicts between our own desires and society's demands from women and our own internalized conflicts and ambivalences are rarely documented. The poet Adrian Rich wrote privately in her diary and then went on to publish these words in her much acclaimed Of Woman Born, Motherhood as Experience and Institution. My children cause me the most exquisite suffering or of which I have any experience. It is the suffering of ambivalence, 
the murderous alternation between bitter resentment and raw-edged nerves and blissful gratification. Sometimes I seem to myself, in my feeling towards those tiny, guiltless little beings, a monster of selfishness and intolerance. I want to talk about ambivalence today, and while we talk about women artists who are mothers and the impact of this on their creativity, I'm really interested in the space between being a mother and not a mother, the almost mother, the not so much a mother, mothering but not a mother, all the various nuances and gray areas, the fuzzy boundaries. I want to talk about ambivalence because I see much of Hepworth's work as much about ambivalence in mothering where the mother and child are joined together, but I see this tension, this push and pull, a desire to stand apart, but never too far away. The theme of maternal ambivalence is also explored by Dor Doris Lessing in much of her work, in particular her most famous novel, The Golden Notebook. Not simply hatred or love, maternal ambivalence is about a mother recognizing the breadth of emotions she may feel towards her child and role as a mother, from adoration to vexation, from tenderness to despair. I'm a writer and mother, and I wrote this book, Motherhood, while intensely mothering during a pandemic. I'm a mother all the time, and I'm a writer all the time. But it is the coexistence of these two things, these two states of me, that I often find disorienting. I sometimes wonder if my mothering supports my creativity and vice versa. I know that I've written more than ever since I had the twins six years ago. I've written hungrily and ravenously while trying to bring forth all the words and sentences that seem to be bursting with a sense of urgency. I make many notes in my phone, tiny fragments of beguiling thoughts persuading me to come back to my desk. You have to wait, I'll tell them with a smile. You will be okay because we will meet again very soon, I say to myself and to them. And I go back to cooking, feeding, running around with my children, while those fragments sparkle and jostle within myself all the time, desperate to not be drowned out in my children's giggles and wails. I have to hold on to these thoughts, tightly and tenderly, lest they disappear in the wind. These thoughts are all I have sometimes that remind me that I'm a writer. Sometimes I want to escape my writing because these fragmentary thoughts are slithering away and I can't grasp at them not make sense of the enigma that my book has become. And sometimes I want to escape my mothering because these thoughts are nudging me and all I want to do is to get them down on paper before the sharp edges poke holes in my belief that I can mother and write at the same time, both equally well. I think the discourse around motherhood and ambivalence is so much about body, choice, and desires. The freedom for our bodies, the freedom to own our choices, and freedom with our desires, not just sexual, but also the desire to be our true selves, to carve out a shape of motherhood that we want. But often we don't have a choice. The intersectional aspects of autonomy in terms of the complex and interrelated effects of race, class, ethnicity, on the decision that a woman makes about her body, and also the choices that are not offered to her, are also not well understood or considered. There is still very little published information about the reproductive needs of women of color. Any discussion that does occur is also dichotomous, based in categories defined as white and non-white, devoid of the diversity of different intersecting layers. And so individual choices and constraints are never discussed. The micro aspects of choice and autonomy ignored and dismissed. The experience of motherhood differs across race and class. And if we take social, economic, and historical differences into account, we could be more aware of the oppression, diversity, and inequality amongst women. Women of color do not experience motherhood in the same way as white women. Motherhood for women of color is wrought with anxiety about racial bias and prejudice towards themselves, but also towards their children. The anguish, the pain, the loss, the joy. How can we smooth out the bands, treat all mothering as one faceless, homogenous mask? Being a mother of color is a different ball game altogether. Being a mother to a black son is a different pain altogether right now.
This is analogous colors, Titus Kafar, Time Magazine protest issue, June 15, 2020. I posted this on my Instagram two years ago now. I read the heartbreaking story of Ralph Yal and was reminded of this. The image references George Floyd calling out for his mother during his arrest as he was pinned to the ground and held down by the police officer for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And this is an excerpt from the piece that Kafar wrote alongside. In her expression, I see the black mothers who are unseen and rendered helpless in this fury against their babies. As I listlessly wade through another cycle of violence against black people, I paint a black mother, eyes closed, furrowed brow, holding the contour of a loss. Is this what it means for us? Are black and loss analogous colors in America? Motherhood while being othered is a wholly different ball game. Maybe better, maybe worse, but how does one compare apples with oranges? Just different. But how do, often do we talk about the difference? Same is easy to process. The homogeneous amalgamation of experiences into one colorless blob is easier to manage. And the bands, variations, gradations, the contours in the maps of mothering are obliterated and smoothed out to the point of eraser. For instance, I've been doing a lot of research in Australian archives and libraries recently. Colonial governance introduced in the state and territories created rigid systems of segregation that were presented as protection for Aboriginal people. In Western Australia, the Aborigine, Aborigines Act 1905 removed the legal guardianship of the Aboriginal parents. It made all their children legal wards of the state. So the government did not require parental permission to relocate the mixed race children to institutions. In 1915, in New South Wales, the Aborigines Protection Amending Act 1915 gave the, Abort the Protection Board authority to remove Aboriginal children without even having to establish in court that they were neglected. The state restricted an Aboriginal woman's choice of marriage and sexual partner and per perhaps most notoriously created the antinatalist policies that removed their rights as mothers to raise their children. These policies led to the scandal of the stolen generation, as you know. Patriarchal colonial power deemed Aborigines as inferior, but further relegated Aboriginal women to the bottom of the evolutionary ladder, below, even below Aboriginal men. It is important to recognize that despite relatively recent reforms, many of the controls put in place over a century ago still exist under different frameworks. For example, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are still being forcibly removed from their families at a rate of 400 times greater than that of the stolen generation. As of June 2018, there were 17,644 First Nations children in out-of-home care as a result. Um, this is a sketch of Turan Dure, who I found about um, in my research, and her daughter. Um, she was a, a guide, an interpreter, and she was born in the early 1800s. Her daughter, Bellandella, was born around 1831. This is a story of a mother, a woman, who guided the first Charvair general, Thomas Mitchell, while carrying her daughter on her back. She's not mentioned in any official documents, nor credited formally for her contribution, or the way she was mothering while performing this labor for the colonists. I found mentions of her in Thomas Mitchell's diary in the library archives in Sydney, and we don't know what happened to her after 1836 when she was not accepted back by her people, but the expedition didn't need her and she was injured and could not walk. Her daughter was taken away to live with Mitchell, who was pleased to help Bellandella escape the wretched state of slavery that he believed Aboriginal women faced. That he persisted in this view, even though Turandere had just acted relatively independently, guiding him around her country and beyond, belied his greater wish to take back an Aboriginal child with the intention of ascertaining what might be the effect of education upon one of that race. Ballandella was brought to Sydney to live with Mitchell's family, but she was not regarded as a true member of the family. When Mitchell returned to England with his wife and children in 1837, Ballandella was left behind. 
Mitchell later described taking her in as an experiment in developing the mental energies of the Australian Aborigines. He proudly reported that she read at a similar level to white children of the same age after he took her in. Rebecca Balmore um, is um, an um, Anishinaabe artist and a member of the First Nation in Canada. In her work, Matriarch, Balmore represents the mother of a First Nations teenager who froze to death after being abandoned on the outskirts of Saskatoon. These are the mothers who experience the starlight tours, a practice where native people who are seen to be rowdy were picked up and dropped off in sub-freezing temperature by the police, left to walk back on their own, often just in their t-shirts. Belmore gestures towards the pain of state violence enacted against the Can Canada's indigenous mothers in particular, their motherhood seen as inadequate, judged and punished as if they were raising criminals. On January 28, 2002, police officer drove Darrell Knight five kilometers outside of Saskatoon and abandoned him in minus 22 degrees Celsius weather with a t-shirt and jean jacket on his back. Ever since Knight's starlight tour, his entire family has been living in a reserve outside the city. Although his mother Rosa says Saskatoon is her home, she won't return. She can't go back. Motherhood in these communities is displacement and being erased pushed to the margins, quite literally. Motherhood, mothering, hope, optimism, in the face of inequalities and injustice, choosing to be a mother while being another can be seen as a rev radical revolutionary act in itself. But while I say this, I've also been thinking about Jennifer Nash's word. There has been intensified scholarly and popular interest in representing black motherhood as both a site constituted by grief unexpected loss and as a political position made visible only because of its proximity to death. It's certainly the case that a cultural inattention to motherhood has been replaced by an intense investment in representing at least some aspects of the nature and meaning of motherhood and in representing certain mothers, particularly black mothers, as symbols of trauma and injury, of pain that can be mobilized for legitimate political ends and social change. Black women come into focus as political subjects through maternity and through maternal practices that are intimate with loss, grief, and death. Indeed, it's crucial to continue to interrogate why black women's subjectivity is political visible only when it stands for the loss of another. A proximity to dead or dying black, usually male, bodies. I think it's pronounced Eileen, Eileen Bothma, an artist from Cape Town, knits with nylon stockings, stitches with human hair, and performs interventional actions with household furniture. In her work, the body, specifically female and maternal bodies, is everywhere signaled, but seldom present. This, and this creates this reflective tension within her work that speaks to how narratives of gendered roles and identities are written into representation. So this work, Entangled Particles, um, is she's swaddled in a heavy blanket, and the artist is dealing with the subsumation of her self-identity in raising a child, and questioning the narratives around a mother figure. What the artist calls her deliberately bad knitting is central here. Bhatma also creates a narrative for her work itself, encouraging possibilities for the interpretation of creative labor as well. What emerges is this foregrounding of women's ambivalence, the space between the binaries and the interest in oppositions. But what also interests me is the gaze with which motherhood has been represented in artwork, religious icons with sentimental mentality, within patriarchal ideals of female roles, and how this artwork subverts it. But how often do we subvert it? In my book, I also talk about the way maternal bodies are represented as seen and also racialized. In the late 20th century, the American painter, and you've, I'm sure you've heard or, or seen her work, Alice Neal, painted a series of sexualized pregnant nudes. And though she did not clearly attribute this as a feminist statement, she saw this as a retort to the prevalent male gaze that did not depict pregnancy, even though it was a basic life's fact. Annie Leibovitz's image of Demi Moore from the cover of Vanity Fair in 1991 
um, became, unintentionally became a symbol of women's empowerment, while also mobilizing a highly divisive debate around sexuality and pregnant bodies. That issue of the magazine was sold shrink-wrapped on newsstands, much like a porn magazine, and a number of news agents' chains refused to sell it, deeming it unsuitable. Yet the maternal but erotic image made it the best-selling single issue in the magazine's history and made headlines around the globe. This prompted many celebrities to unabashedly photograph their bump rather than hide it, and as white motherhood took center stage, it also heralded an era of increasing self-regulation and self object objectification for pregnant bodies, and Instagram has added to this glorification of white motherhood over the years. And I write about Instagram here, but we had a conversation about Instagram just now and how that affects the whole performance of maternity and motherhood on that as well. The cultural historian Karen Heens says that the visible pregnant body demonstrates that a woman is sexually active, and I know um, Hetty talked about it a little bit yesterday as well, and that is hugely problematic. When women, men wrote about pregnancy portraits, they used F euphemism, the French word for pregnancy. And my French is terrible, so I'm not going to say it. Enchante, en translates as an enclosure or the enclosing wall of a fortified place. So it immediately dehumanizing the person who's pregnant to be seen only as a vessel, as an enclosure for the growing um, baby. And I, I talk a lot about, um, in my book, but also generally about how we idolize motherhood but not mothering in our society. In recent times, it has become more common to see pregnant bodies on our screens, in our social media squares and timelines. Nevertheless, when Beyoncé announced her pregnancy with a series of photographs in 2017, symbolically drawing from a range of cultural and historical sources, what subliminal references to Botticelli, birth of Venus, and reminiscent of Renaissance portraits of the Madonna with her blue veil, it created a sensation. Perhaps particularly because it brought into focus how women's bodies have historically been marginalized and violated, while also continually objectified. The reappropriation of the image of the Virgin Mary was particularly telling and controversial. Um, the predominant depiction of Mary is that of white superiority, of positioning whiteness as pure and divine. And as a black woman, um, Beyoncé not only posited a sexualized, heavily pregnant body, but also challenged those cultural norms with what cultural critic and theorist Bell Hooks calls the oppositional gaze, gaze to see, name, and question, and ultimately transform oppressive, racialized images. Research shows that black and brown women experience racialized pregnancy stigma. They reported encountering assumptions that they had low incomes, were single, and had multiple children. Hyperfertility uh, is something that is um, assigned to black and women, uh, brown women as well. And had multiple children, regardless of socioeconomic status, marital status, or parity. So this hyperfertilization, because it was assumed that black and brown women could birth, give birth very easily and they had large families and they had lots of children, this is also why the conversation around infertility is so stigmatized, but also so much silence around it in black and brown communities. Women encountered racialized pregnancy stigma in everyday life, healthcare, social services, and housing-related contests, making it difficult to complete tasks without scrutiny. For many, racialized pregnancy stigma was a source of stress, and it may contribute to poorer maternal and infant outcomes by way of reduced access to quality health care, impediments to services, resources, and social support, and poorer psychological health. Black women in the UK are four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth than white women. Asian and mixed-race women are twice as likely. I think mothering is always already characterized by loss, whether that is the collateral loss of former identity in the mother or the unavoidable fear of loss when expecting a child, the physical and emotional loss, whether that is through abortion or the inability to conceive, and mother through personal and political circumstances. Um, I've talked about only a very tiny aspect of other and otherhood and motherhood here from a very cisgender, heterosexual perspective, which is also a privileged view, really. Otherhood and motherhood, the margins of motherhood, outside the hegemonic, ethnocentric construction, comes at the intersection of disability, queerness, gender non-conforming identities, class, and so on. 
It comes in form of mothering but not have birth a child, almost being a mother but not quite, the interrupted motherhood, and all the way we are often not one or the other, a mother or a non-mother, but somewhere in between. I think it is the issue not only of choice, but also the access to choice. These rigid classifications and assignations of who and what a woman is, based on appearances, and who can give birth, who should be called a mother, are all traps that do not consider multiple experiences, especially of those who are on the fringes. And this is something I wrote in the book. Is there a color for motherhood? Is it all pink and blue, or is there room for gray? Is there a color of womanhood? Is it all red, ripe, or green, so fertile? Or shades of pink and gray around the edges and brown? Is there a color of home, of belonging? Is it all a shifting parkinje, dark when it should be light? I see in colors, in hues, in shades, but sometimes there just aren't enough colors, enough names, enough words. Have you been looking at the black and white for so long? Thank you. Thank you so much for that brilliant talk. And I think it really is important, and we spoke about this in the introduction, but to really try and start to describe in betweenness. Um, and I, I was really struck, probably by your idea about gradients, about the fuzziness of boundaries, of non-fixity as well, um, of positions, of of being mothers, of not being mothers, of these things not being separate categories in their own safe pigeonholes, which can be clearly defined or described. So I think, again, just in thinking about the broader themes and topics and ideas that are coming out of the whole event, I think that was... Thank you for kind of helping articulate um, that um, the, 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 some of that messiness, the chaos of, of, of trying to describe that as well. So um, that's just quite a personal response to, you so to your, to your you. talk there. But I wanted to ask you as well about maybe um, some of that boundary crossing that you do in your own work, because you're a data scientist by training and work in quite a, a, a social sciences background and a, a sort of work within data in empirical ways of number crunching and I'm sure you work with spreadsheets quite a lot um, but also the kind of yeah the boundary crossing that you do as a writer and as a creative as we as we've seen uh, there and how you the intersection that or the intersections of that work between the personal the political um, and the professional. So how, how do you go about kind of working um, with that? Do you find it a, a productive tension? Is it something that you um, are thinking over? Just, I, I'd be interested to just think about that in a, a sort of in, from your career as well. Thank you so much. That's a really interesting question. I think one of the reasons is that I think I'm quite resistant to boxes and <laughs> labels. I think from a very young age I was. I was already always trying to dismantle those uh, kind of expectations that people place on me or norms. So one of the reasons is that um, my first degree was actually architecture. So I'm really always interested in the intersection between art and science. I've always been, and I do feel like we keep those disciplinary boundaries very rigid sometimes, especially in academia, I've noticed that. But my work was always interdisciplinary. So my PhD was like psychology and cognitive science and computer science and, and geography and everything kind of um, uh, intersecting between those. Um, and I looked at the notion of different concepts. Again, I'm, I'm really interested in challenging concepts that society places. So, for instance, recently I've written a book about hysterical and how the notion of hysterical is imposed on women as well. Um, I, I really find it stimulating um, working in this way, about this cross-disciplinary way, because I think that is the only way we should and can really make it a very fertile kind of um, 
production. E either we just do it ourselves or we work in collaboration with other people because sometimes when we sit within those boundaries, um, we can create echo chambers and we, we don't have like this cross-pollination of ideas. Um, but I think my brain just works like that, that I, <laughs> um, and so I'm a behavioral and data scientist and I look at behavioral behaviors and psychology and cognitive science so I'm, and also how behavioral data and data kind of affects um, a society and how data is represented. Um, I love writing um, about things. Uh, it's not always pleasant or pleasurable. It's a very painful process, often as most creatives would know. Um, and certainly failure is a big part of it and rejection is a big part of it. But um, I don't know if that answers your question. I kind of rambled on, <laughs> like my brain does, yeah, yes. Yeah. Interesting. And in, in your book as well, you talk about the, the landscape of data mm -hmm. and how um, that has privileged and, and most of yeah. the studies have been centred on white women mm. in Europe and North America. And I wonder whether is that landscape changing partly as the community of research is changing or is it, are there still you know, huge leaps um, and... W you know, just a tremendous amount of work to done just to start to kind of make um, different inroads into the evidence that the data is is providing, from which then the kind of narrative journeys that you're yeah. mapping can come, you know, can, can produce or can can start to imagine. Yeah, data certainly has privilege, and it's a reflection of who is collecting the data, um, who has resources, who, what did they consider valid uh, to be collected. So when we look at archives, we often find the things that have not been protected or preserved are the ones that the colonialists or colonizers didn't think were valuable enough, and so all that knowledge, embedded knowledge, has been lost. And similarly with data, um, it's a, it's, like mental, it's a model of the world, and it's only very selective, so people only select data that they think are representative of the world that they are interested in. So yes, women's experiences have long been dismissed. Um, and, and, and I was really, when I was writing this book in 2019, 20, um, when I was kind of putting it together, I found that actually the a fertility authority in, in the UK, because I'd gone through the whole infertility experience myself, and I'd written about how I'd not seen anybody who looked like me in, on those rooms, waiting rooms where I was sitting or anything like that. But when I looked at the data, they hadn't disaggregated the data according to ethnicity, so there was no record of how many black and brown women were, had been on this journey, so I couldn't really find any data of how, even the data representation of that. And then I was trying to really look at, I wanted this book to be the space where um, different stories can be of voices who are on the margins can be heard. So I was interested in trans experiences and gender non-conforming, non-binary, and I find that there's hardly any data about them, um, about these communities who are already marginalized and their voices or their representation is very, they're very silenced. So um, I spoke to, as I say in the book, I spoke to quite a few, but I didn't ultimately include those stories, just relying on case research studies or things that are read on the paper, newspapers and contemporary day, uh, stories uh, because I didn't want to speak on anybody's behalf. But yes, uh, the lack of data is a huge worry because then we don't hear the experiences of these communities and we have other people who have privilege speaking on their behalf. You know? And what about the response to the book? Again, because often I think a lot of people have spoken about this, the process and um, quite a, n a number of people have said, you know, I did this work uh, during the pandemic as well. That was a, um, a space of, you know, kind of production where, <laughs> you know, you were forced in a way to, to do some, some projects and, and leave other ones behind and so in this sort of the isolated circumstances of, of, of writing in, in the pandemic and then releasing these ideas into the world um, could you describe some of the the response or the reactions that some of those those of the that might have surprised you or you weren't <laughs> expecting um, so it's been interesting. Um, I, um, when I first thought about writing this book so as I said I didn't talk about my experiences of mothering or motherhood or anything because 
I think there's a lot of internalized shame and guilt. I didn't even talk about infertility to my mom. She didn't know I was going through all that. I didn't talk with anybody about any experience. I went the early, you just think your stories are mundane and you kind of soldier on and you go on. And, but also there's an internalized shame and I talk a lot about shame now. Um, but at that point I hadn't. And so when I thought about writing this book, it was because I felt like I hadn't seen this kind of representation much in, and, and at that point. So when the book went out of submission in early 2020, actually a lot of publishers said, um, this, everything's been written about motherhood. So <laughs> I don't think we'll want another. We, I've already got somebody who's writing about motherhood, but that is a completely different person and a white woman who's middle class who's writing about motherhood. So it couldn't be the same as my story. So there was still a box ticking going on about who gets to tell these stories and whose stories are considered valid and, and, and all those kind of things. Um, since the book came out, it's been amazing. I've had so many messages of hope and optimism, of just being seen, and especially women who, like women of color especially, but also other women who felt like, oh, it's really some emotional messages left for me, uh, voicemails and things which I, I feel overwhelmed, but I don't know what to do with that because it's really... And it really makes me emotional to think that people have felt seen and heard by this book and um, how it has resonated with them. So it's been really a privilege and an honor. <laughs>